This week's episode made possible by our friends at Independent Bank. You can learn more about them at i-bankonline.com. Good morning, Memphis. You're listening to Meanwhile in Memphis on WYXR 91.7 FM. I'm Christy Mullen, and I'm here with my co-host, Anna Thompson. Good morning, Memphis. <laughs> and we are here again for another exciting episode this Tuesday morning. AT, how was your weekend? How are you feeling this morning? I'm feeling I'm feeling good. Pretty good. Um, I gotta say, I'm excited about this topic. I'm yeah. a little nervous about this topic. It's I, this topic I feel is going to hit home uh, specifically for both of us. Yeah. Um, I feel like in very different ways, but mm-hmm. it is a very timely topic, and we are super excited per use to bring it to you today. So um, this is one of my favorite kind of episodes to do because it is a TED episode. If you're new here, New Memphis brings the annual TEDx Memphis conference here to our city. And in short, what that is, is the big TED. You've heard of it. You know it. You love it. The global premise of that we bring here to the local stage and just bring these amazing innovators and change makers that are making a difference right here in the 901 um, to a platform that gets their message out there more. And our guest today is no exception. AT, tell us a little bit about Okay, so Nighat Akbar Shah is an impact investor, an entrepreneur, a producer, a philanthropist, and she is originally from Chitral, Pakistan. I believe I said that correctly. Uh, She is the co-founder and vice president of Shaw Holdings Group, a real estate development and management company where she serves as the head of finance. Recently, she produced a short film on mental health awareness and suicide prevention, and she is here in the studio to discuss that along with her 2021 TEDx Memphis talk titled How Becoming Disagreeable Saved My Life. And... I really am just so excited. She, like many, many, many of our guests, wears so many hats Mm -hmm. and does so many things. And yet it is a personal crusade of hers for many, many reasons to um, really prioritize mental health, which is something that is critically important always. But particularly in the past few years, I feel like everybody's understanding of it has bubbled to the surface absolutely she does it also with such a vulnerability at opening up her life absolutely to, uh, the viewer and uh, we just can't wait to dive in and let you guys not only get to hear a little bit more about her and her life and her story but also get to hear her TED talk because with a title like this how can you not be interested in getting into it so we're just going to start the show all right let's get to it <laughs> Welcome, Nigat. How are you? Uh, Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate you guys taking time and inviting me here this morning. I I'm excited. I, yeah, I'm very excited for this one. I think me and AT both are just really amped on the topic that you're here to talk about today. But before we get in yes. to all the juiciness mm-hmm. that that will be, we want to hear a little bit more about you and give the audience a little insight into who you are. So you aren't originally from Memphis, correct? Yes, no. I I was born and raised in uh, Chitral, Pakistan. So I moved to United States 20 years ago. So all my life, I could say I have always been a businesswoman. Mm-hmm. So ever since I moved to United States, my husband and I started with real estate started with a gas station oh, business okay. and then we moved our way up to uh, real estate commercial real estate development and convenience stores management okay so we we've been lucky in that sense that um, we have made a very nice business out of real estate development and that's mm-hmm. our uh, main day-to-day job I went back to school in 2009 to study business administration uh, majoring in finance mm-hmm. oh. So uh, finance, business has been the core kind of work that I have done. Right. At the same, right now I can also say that I'm a film producer. I recently produced a short film. Uh, I talked about it in my TED Talk. Mm-hmm. So that's about me. And I have two amazing kids. <laughs> <laughs> you can't forget them. No, <laughs> not absolutely. At all. Um, so you, you have many, many things on your plate. You have a very full, full day. And our, I think we all women have <laughs> so much on our plate. Yes, I would agree thankfully. with that. I yeah. would agree with that. It is yeah. forever overflowing is what it feels like. So mm-hmm. with your career and the things all of the I mean, you do a lot, as we said, you could kind of call anywhere home if you really wanted to. What makes you want to stay and call Memphis home? That's very true. Actually, I consider myself a very international person, but something is in Memphis that brings me back. I think I grew up in 
in a mountainous region in uh, northern parts of Pakistan, that's very quiet area, mm -hmm. right? So when first, when I moved to Memphis, Tennessee, I felt the same serenity. It was not oh, very crowded. Yeah. And ever since, you know, I made that big move from one part of the world to the other part of the world, and I kind of felt grounded, and I don't want to move anywhere else. Yeah. I could go to places, we travel a lot, but at the end of the day, I want to come back to Memphis. Uh, so interesting like that, that so you think it's so serene because I feel like it has to be very different than your home city. But you know, when I when I came, I came to Canada to Toronto. Okay, I stayed there for a year and so. So Canada is very crowded. Toronto is like more than half of Canada's population live in Toronto. I don't think so I realized it was that much. Wow, it's that it's more than that. <laughs> so it's very crowded. But when then I moved to. Memphis in 2001 so think about it then it was not very crowded yeah I can definitely so. see how it's ebbed and flowed over the last couple of yeah. decades but I yeah it always intrigues me so what was um, exciting to you about was there what was the reason that you chose that you and your husband chose Memphis my husband was here before me he okay. came here for business opportunities okay so both of us came here and we started our business and you know you go where uh, money takes you yes Sometimes your you have to, uh, yeah. uh, livelihood yes. uh, like takes you so you have to be able to provide <laughs> we have <laughs> to be able to provide so we stayed here we worked like hard and with trial and errors we made a good living out of mm -hmm. our businesses and I can say that we are very uh, happy and fortunate to be living the American dream I love that. I think it says that on your website too, right? Yes. Doesn't it? I love that. <laughs> yes. It makes me happy. Well, because that's you guys have the Shaw Holdings Group. Yes. Um, which I'm assuming is kind of what your husband began and you're the VP of currently. Yeah. So what really led, you spoke a little bit about y'all are in development and real mm -hmm. estate. What, what about that just kind of fuels you? Like, what do you like about that line of work? You know, this this company my husband and i started mm -hmm. together like we came here we were not doing any business so oh, okay. we bought one uh rundown store and worked our way from there oh cool okay so um what i like about our business module is this that um we try to we have owner operators it's not that we have managers who work in our stores. Mm -hmm. We have, most of our stores have owner operators. They are our partners. Okay. Yeah. So they run the store for us, for themselves and for us. So when they profit, we profit. Mm -hmm. We make money when they make money. So this is the thing that we enable families to earn. So we are also profitable. Inter that is an interesting model, kind of giving families the stepping stones to own their own thing, yes. but in turn, it's you giving them the tools they need to do that. Yes. It's a win-win. Yes. It's empowering, too. It's to, very, that to that's keeps keeps us kind of uh, fueled. Yeah. Helping others succeed. More. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, talking about fueling your fire, you are a humanitarian, as you mentioned, and so I know that's a big way you spend your time when you're not working, your mini, yeah. wearing your mini hats during the day at work. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some of your favorite humanitarian efforts that you're a part of? You know, uh, Christy, I'm a b big um, proponent of uh, women financial empowerment. Mm -hmm. So women financial, without women financial empowerment, so many of the causes that, that are closer to our heart are not possible mm -hmm. because we have to have women in decision-making position, in powerful position where they can lobby for the causes that are closer to our yes. heart. So we have to be able to spend money without money there's no uh, freedom or empowerment. So one thing I work with is women financial empowerment, also I here in the United States and also in the areas in the area where I grew up. I okay. was born and I was raised yeah. in Chitral. So, and also I'm also uh, invested in mental health and suicide prevention. At the same time, uh, teaching skill development to youth and these are a couple of, and also I also, um, my husband and I support St. Jude's and uh, Mid-South Food Bank. Yeah. Wow. Two amazing yeah. causes. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. They are very close to my heart also. So um, the mental like health awareness mm -hmm. and the suicide prevention brings me to your award-winning short film. Yes, ma'am. This Bank of the River. Yeah. Um, and 
Can you tell me a little bit more about this film and why it was so important to you to, one, tell the story, but also Mm -hmm. do it in the form of a short film? That seems like it was a different kind of an offshoot for you, or have you always been interested in producing films? No, not at all. (laughs) (laughs) I became a producer out of default. Okay. Because, you know, I'm from this small mountainous region of Pakistan. It's serene. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. People are so kind. And their claim to fame is their hospitality and their kindness. But for the past 10 to 15 years, I we have been noticing an increase in mental problems and suicide rate. So I wanted to do something about it. I'm the kind of person who who likes to go there and do something. I don't necessarily talk the talk. I like to be uh, walk walk yes. the talk yes. kind of person. Not just words, actions. No, yeah. yes. Yeah. Some actions are very important. If not me, then who? Mm-hmm. That's exactly it. It's not somebody else's problem. You took yes. that very, you were like, yeah. I want to go help with this. Yeah. It was it was kind of distant problem until this happened in my own family. My right. very dear cousin completed suicide. And one month after that, my husband's cousin also shot himself to death. So this was a very kind of heartbreaking situation in our family. But And then I decided to do something about it in a concrete way. Um, the film, the idea of a film was how people take stories to their heart. Mm -hmm. They learn something from this Mm -hmm. story. Instead of uh, giving them public service announcement or uh, taking them through seminars, it's like kind of preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have mental health and suicide prevention become a mainstream media talk topic in Pakistan as well as in other parts of the world. So suicide and mental health is not only Pakistan problem Mm -hmm. or the problem of that small area. It's like world problem. Absolutely. Even when I showed it to some of my friends in Memphis, they they were so much connected. They even cried after watching the film. Absolutely. So I I mean, it uh, like you said, it is a worldwide problem, especially in the last few years. I feel like that has been even heightened the the stress of mental health problems and things like that. It's just it feels like we just put everything in a pressure cooker and True. we got there faster like everything is just very heightened yeah during covid yes right everything became so tough especially for uh, young adults yes it was a tough situation because they were trying to become adults and there were there were moms and there were young mothers parents it was a tough situation so mental health is something that we should care more for i completely agree and i think when you put stories in a creative art form, whether yeah. that be film, actual fine art, yeah. et cetera, I feel like it delivers the message in a heightened way to people. Yes. And how you said people kind of had that impact walking away from the film. I, I don't know that you could have accomplished that in a different way. Like you, you probably could have, you could have given a speech, like you could have, but that film touched people in a way yeah. that you just knew was needed. True. And so I think that's a very br- brave thing to do, first of all, for you yeah. to step out and take mm-hmm. that on, but also very needed because to AT's point about the mm-hmm. pandemic heightening everything, yeah. something I do think was, a pr- I see it as a pro, mm-hmm. is coming out of this cycle of the pandemic. We're still in it, but, you know, we're kind of coming out. People I have noticed are becoming more comfortable having the conversation about mental health. And so how do you think the pandemic has kind of shifted that narrative of people becoming more okay with saying, I'm not okay? It's a lovely thing, you know. It's a lovely thing that people are okay now to say that I'm not okay. Because um, in many parts of the world, mental health is still a taboo subject. Very stigmatized, yeah. Very, very much. So I was trying to tell people that it's okay to talk about mental health mm-hmm. and it's about it's okay to say that I'm not okay so even now that the film is not released yet but there's a hype about the film mm-hmm. people talk about the film and as they're talking about the film they're also discussing mental health and also the suicide prevention mm-hmm. so I really like it so I I will share this with you uh, 
in June, the film is having its UK premiere. Premiere, awesome. So after that, it will be released to a couple of uh, very good platforms. Oh, uh, more people can get that's access. That's exciting. Yes. <laughs> yes. How does that feel? Like, how do you feel right now knowing? I know it has to be nerve-wracking, but also exciting. It's very exciting. Yeah, it's uh, our, our little effort is yeah. uh, being, like, credited and understood and kind of appreciated. So it feels good. And yeah. the, I think the thing, too, is your hope in creating this was that it would become a more mainstream topic. And so the reaction has to be like, yes, like they they want this. They need everybody needs this. Yeah. And they are craving this kind of a medium to showcase and make something a topic yeah. that is more mainstream, because like you said, even if here in the U.S. or even in other parts of the world, it is becoming less stigmatized to say yeah, I'm yeah. not all right yeah it doesn't mean everywhere mm-hmm. that's still the case particularly in strong traditional environments True. um that that yeah. is still a very taboo topic I mean things need to be a certain way all the time and women especially need to be a certain way that's, most that's times. very true because you know women are supposed to be um tradition uh, supposed to give in to traditions yeah and they uh, they are expected to be a certain way they are expected to do certain things and uh, they are not allowed to do certain other things yeah. and they are supposed to be agreeable nice and all the time uh, kind mm-hmm. because you know they cannot show their true selves so these are some of the stigmas that are attached to being a woman in many parts of the world absolutely Abs- yeah yes. i completely agree i think being a woman is Not the only thing. Of course, men are not immune to having to be agreeable, right? Like, that is not. But I do feel and retweet what you guys kind of just said. Like, it's the higher expectation put on women um, to just go through life and be super nice and kind because that's what's expected of us. But how much farther would we have gotten by now if we weren't? That's very true because, you know, what we do, uh, one of my, one of the coaches that I really follow says that we are obsessed with how women are mm-hmm. and what men do. Yep. Like, we are obsessed oh, with, she's so it. pretty, she's nice, she's kind. Yep. On the other hand, we praise boys for doing something because, like, sh- he kicked the ball. Mm-hmm. He's so amazing with his uh, uh, studies things like that right we praise them for doing things and we praise girls just for being Uh, that's very right so this is the this is the uh, centuries old condition conditioning for girls that we want them to be sweet kind and on the other hand we want our guys to be assertive uh, go out there earn money Right? Yeah, dominant, like, yeah, go-getter. like Go-getter. Those yeah. types of things are not, um, when they're applied to women, they're not generally that nice. <laughs> yeah, if girls, are, if girls are assertive, they're called bossy. Yes. If women are um, strong, they're called, like, uh, bitchy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's, I was just bad. fixing to say my first kind of foray into this was when I was a lot younger. There was a documentary done on Nicki Minaj. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I can't remember if it was MTV or VH1. It was kind of one of those behind the music, not a behind the music, but like yeah. that. And she's in a recording studio having a conversation with a man on her team. And she's like, you know, if a guy says how he wants something, if he says, this is how I want it, this is how you're going to do it, I'm paying you for the service, he's called a boss. Yes. He's like, if I do it, I'm caught another B word that is, exactly. you know, like, and so that was my first thing as a young woman seeing that conversation. I know it's funny to like think of it in that way, yeah. but I was like, she's right. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, honestly, sadly, going back to another documentary about another singer, the Taylor Swift documentary oh, yeah. too, where she's talking really loudly and she's in her own home mm-hmm. and she's like, sorry, I'm being so loud. And then she goes, no, I'm not. This is my own house. I can exactly. talk however loud I want. Yes. But her initial response to being loud was like, oh, I need to calm down. I need yes. to stop. I need to lessen myself. And then she had to, you know, break that conditioning yes. to be like, 
I own this home. This yes. is mine. The house I, I can, paid for. I can yes. be as loud as I want in this house. Yeah, we, we are conditioned to second guess ourselves All the time. every time. And you know how many times? I mean, it's it's very true that when girls start their sentence, I'm sorry. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the amount yes. of times I do that. <laughs> right? We all do that. I mean, but we have to condition our, ourselves out of it. Mm-hmm. Right? I think it's about time that uh, we change ourselves first and then just say, I disagree. I disagree what society has been expecting me to do. I don't want to do this. I'm not um, wired to cook in the house all day long. Although I love uh, amazingly cooked meal, but I may not be the person who will be doing all the cooking. Because not every woman loves to cook, right? Or bake or clean or yes. raise children or whatever. Fill in whatever blank Exactly. It is. Some of us are very good with numbers. Mm-hmm. Some of us are very good with finances. Some of us are good uh, creatively. Mm-hmm. So we have to kind of now understand our true nature, that we don't have to do all the things that society has um, established for us. Absolutely can do other things it's not up to us to uplift and hold it all yeah like it's just not and I think what you just said kind of brings us perfectly into the subject of your TED talk um so when I remember the day like when your topic came across my desk and I saw the premise and was reading the application I was just like oh this is gonna be a good one. Thank you. Um, not even just because I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm being attacked right now. Yeah, I need, I need this talk <laughs> in the best yeah. way. Yeah. Um, but I just thought it was such a powerful and needed thing. So I really want to know what made you want to apply to give the talk. Um, I I just I just thought that I have some um, insights about how to not do what everybody expects you to do yeah and i have applied that in my life and you know if you have something that you that benefit you and if you don't share it to, with others that means you're greedy you're selfish mm. so i know it's so hard for me i'm not a very extrovert person i'm very introvert so when i go to parties or someplace you'll find me in a corner <laughs> Same. People, <laughs> yeah it, it takes me a minute. <laughs> yeah, maybe a friend will come and visit me there for yeah. a while and uh, and then leaves me because, <laughs> you know, that happens. But it was a um, leap of kind of faith and also a leap of uh, coming out of my comfort zone. Mm-hmm. So I applied for that and I was accepted and I was so happy. I was about to say, how, like, <laughs> were you just yeah. kind of shocked when you got that? Yeah, I was I was really happy when and I was uh, terrified at the same yeah. time <laughs> because, oh, my God, now it's real. You're how like, am I going to prepare for that whole thing? I'm an introvert and now I have to go on stage. Yes, and stop. because I also believe that you have to constantly say yes to some of the things that make That's you scary. uncomfortable yeah. if you want to grow. So Absolutely. that's when I, I, I still had a choice to say, no, sorry, I'm yeah. busy. I do a lot of these things. And my husband tells me, you know, just feel yourself like just feel that you are lucky that you are being offered to go yeah. for interview or you are being offered to do TED Talk. Just go and do it. He's my biggest support. I love that. So I, I like that. That's adorable. So even this TED Talk, when it came, yeah. I spent months honing my speech yeah. and even memorizing it because that's what it's TEDx requires. Yes, right? <laughs> it is. That's always the biggest thing. Everybody yeah. who's had, has given a TED Talk is always like, it's different than any other speech I've ever done yeah. because of the um, the nature it's of really what structured. the rules and regulations of what of TED. TED requires. Yeah. And so, I mean, there are no cue cards or no note cards. You get up there and you memorize it and yeah. you, you deliver it within your certain timeline. Yes, <laughs> and that's you, true. you hit all your marks. It is a well-oiled machine. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And you guys had the added pressure of our first time ever being outside. That was another venue. thing. It was yes. like a big thing. Like it was our first, we were trying to bring this thing still in the middle of a pandemic. We did not want to give up bringing Ted to Memphis, Memphis because it's yeah. so needed here. Um, and so we were like, where, where can we have it? And we're like, oh, 
the backyard at the Levitt Show, Memphis's backyard. Um, and you know, so that was a you, challenge. You guys get that credit. You guys organized it amazingly. Hey, I mean, that's so sweet. Thank you. Shout course. out to Nora. I know, right? <laughs> yes, Nora. True. And uh, it was it was hard to expect that there would be that amazing program even yeah. outdoors. Oh, we, we were had, scared too. Don't yeah. Worry. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We had uh, planned. The first timers were scared <laughs> even yeah. more. We, we, we were all scared all together. All of us were sitting on yeah. edge. But it went flawlessly, and you did amazing with your talk. I, my, all, like All the speakers did so great. Thank um, you. Even when the random noise would come by, people just kept going. Pauls did flawless. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask before we let the listeners listen to your talk and everything, since you're very focused on mental health and the process of TED as we talked about is very structured and procedural and there's a lot of stepping outside your comfort zone Mm -hmm. what did you do through that process to kind of keep your own mental health in check as you were preparing thank you for asking me this question Um, let me tell you this it's really important for everybody especially for women to have a support system Mm -hmm. so before doing anything important in your life you have to first understand and know your surroundings and what support system is available for you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to cultivate a support system for yourself. Yes. So I had a very good support system. My kids, my family members, I have amazing siblings, my parents. My husband is my greatest support. You know, when you have that taken care of, you know, your mental pressure is off of you. Now you have other things to worry about, like writing your speech and memorizing it. Now you have to, again, find a support for your speech. So I can name some of the amazing people who helped me with my speech, Mm -hmm. from writing to delivering it. Like um, Caroline Esposto, I don't know if you know her. She's an amazing writer. And then Laura Brassi, Mm -hmm. she um, helped me with my uh she, she's a coach okay. she's an executive speech coach she helped me with that and at the end you guys provided us with Darius, uh, Darius yeah. yeah Darius Wallace and he's amazing with his presentation yeah. skills and the way he instilled some of these sk- skills into his uh, students yeah. so that support really was needed and important that helped me because sometimes you know I have all the amazing thoughts that I want to go out and uh, tell people, mm-hmm. but the way I have to say it needs to be very structured, especially for a speech like TEDx. Right. Yeah, you have to distill down all the different ideas to like which order they should yeah. come in and things like that. It's very interesting to yeah. me, but I loved, um, again, your topic for the urgency, the need for people to hear what yeah. you had to say, which is why I'm, I'm personally thankful that you Thank stepped you. out of your comfort zone and applied and were accepted because, again, I do believe that the time is now. I mean, yeah. it it has been the time for a long time, but certainly right now is the time for women and men, everybody to hear about mental health, so. Agree. Yeah, true. So I think we've kept the people waiting long enough. I know. Um, so this is the perfect place for us to transition into Nagat's 2021 TEDx Memphis talk, How Becoming Disagreeable Saved My Life. <laughs> It is my pleasure to stand here and speak to you about an issue from which we all suffer. You won't see the extent to which it affects you until it stares you in the face. Whether it is you who suffers or those close to you, the degree of torment can lead to tragedy. The dilemma that needs to be addressed today is how we are conditioned by our families and society at large to be agreeable. My courage to become disagreeable has empowered me to shine lights on issues, to express love, and to live in harmony with the passions closest to my heart. By doing what is expected of us, and working endlessly to keep everyone happy, we make ourselves miserable and everyone around us pay a high price. We all have our own story in this cycle. My story is, I am from a small mountainous village where young girls grew up according to society's beliefs. 
My amazing supportive parents provided us with social privileges and educational opportunities that were considered progressive for my impoverished village. Yet, I was still expected to be agreeable. So were my female friends and the women around me. Now, what do I mean by this term agreeable? It is the fear that saying no will disappoint people. Being agreeable is believing that playing nice is the pathway to acceptance. Being agreeable is staying silent on issues you don't agree on so you can avoid conflict. Being agreeable is smiling and trying to keep everyone happy. While the culture expectations in my native country are very different from those of the United States, it's reasonable to believe many of you ladies also grew up in communities and in situations where going along with what was expected of you was the right thing to do. Guys in the audience, it is not just women, whether it is you or other men you know, it is common for, for you to pursue career paths because somewhere along the line you were led to believe it is what the men in your families do. You are made to believe it is dishonorable to pursue career passions that make less money. And you put in excessive hours at work in a job you don't like. Guys, we see you. We all experience mental distress by doing what is expected. After marrying, my husband Ruziman and I relocated to United States, where family values and work ethics were vastly different from our home country. Yet, the implied status quo was very much the same. Looking back, I was caught up fulfilling other people's expectations, this time of becoming a high-performing mother and a high-performing wife. I was a helicopter mom. I was such a perfectionist that I turned everything into a chore, including time with my kids. I was relentless. I secretly struggle with these agonizing questions every single day. What is wrong with me? Why am I so tired? Why do I feel I cannot manage my time? What is my calling? And how can I break this cycle? The empire I had built around doing what I thought was right crashed. As I faced my five-year-old daughter, telling me, Mommy, you are always demanding us. You never spend quality time with us. And my nine-year-old son chimed in with, Mommy, just because you think it is perfect doesn't mean it is good for us. I realized being agreeable to everybody else's expectations was hurting us. In that moment, I knew I had to change my priorities. My husband saw my sudden urgency to strip away the shroud that concealed my true purpose. His support was a win for us. I know I'm the lucky one here because most couples, business partners, and family members strike out when we decide to become disagreeable. My long journey to self-realization led me to live a fulfilled life and also led me to focus on issues such as women financial empowerment, education, youth skill development, and most recently, mental health and suicide prevention. I produced an award-winning short film 
daria ke is par meaning this bank of the river which depicts the story of a young woman living in a beautiful mountainous valley who was unable to say i disagree this moment is inspired by my cousin who is gone forever along with thousands of other agreeable girls and boys who are unable to go against the grain by saying i disagree let it be known becoming disagreeable is a very rewarding but a risky way to approach life business family partnership and relationship however it is a risk worth taking also it is very important to understand what you are disagreeing with you are disagreeing with unrealistic expectations that you know won't serve you everyone in the audience for a moment close your eyes and imagine a time where you wanted to say i disagree open your eyes and repeat these two words i disagree after me i disagree i disagree one more time i disagree i disagree these two words i disagree helped me reach inward to the most powerful parts of myself my dreams my desires and my purpose the two words i disagree will help you open up to a life of purpose and limitless possibilities thank you Welcome back listeners. If you are listening, you are in here listening to Meanwhile in Memphis on WXR 91.7 FM. And we just got to hear the recording of our guest today in the God's 2021 TEDx Memphis talk, How Becoming Disagreeable Saved My Life. And now we're about to jump back into all of the post TEDx questions, which is one of my favorite parts is getting to dive in deeper with the people who gave these amazing talks. So you speak of the dilemma of being agreeable. You kind of set up your talk in that premise. And something you opened with was saying, by working endlessly to keep everyone happy, we make ourselves miserable. And you kind of touched on your own story within that cycle. And it's, as a people pleaser, that statement hit me extremely hard. Um, So why do you think it is that we get in that cycle of working endlessly to please others? Because that's what society's expectations are for us. Uh, for Even for uh, men, not yeah. only for women. Right. Because society expects women to be very kind, very nice, and uh, agree to what the family is asking you to do mm-hmm. and be. And also society also asks men to become amazing earners Mm -hmm. provide to their families otherwise they are considered failures yeah less Mm -hmm. than yeah you know so in order to please everybody and fulfill the expectations of our community of society of families we fall into that cycle of pleasing others knowingly or unknowingly some of us know that we are people pleaser and we can say we do this Mm -hmm. and some of us don't know but still we please people even though we are sarcastic but we still do the things that they expect us to do so this is a kind of a trap that sometimes I feel like I'm very strong. I don't do what other people ask me to do. I'm very sarcastic and I am very uh, 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 loud mouth, (laughs) you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the reality is, even with my loud mouth, make other people uncomfortable, but I still do what the society is expecting of me. 
I feel like so, I'm caught up in that same kind of yeah. conundrum of where I like to think of myself more as like bucking the system yeah. in some ways. And in other ways, I do fall immediately in line Exactly. when I feel as though I've kind of rocked the boat a little too much. Yes. And many of us who consider ourselves strong women, all of us, people pleaser, not people pleaser, we fall into uh, that uh, trap. Mm. It's sacrificing yourself to make someone else's life easier yeah. sometimes. And I think it's just such a delicate push-pull mm -hmm. because it's like, when do you stop sacrificing yourself? Um, you know, When you realize, I believe, when you realize that fulfilling other people's expectations are not filling your need and not making you and your family happy, mm -hmm. then I think it's the uh, wake-up call. It was a wake-up call for me. To be honest, my uh, wake-up call was given to me by my little daughter. She was five or six at that time. So other than that, I was thinking I'm just a perfect mother, perfect <laughs> wife. I was doing everything. Yeah. But her remarks about not spending quality time with her made me very yeah. uncomfortable in my own like, amazing, wonderful life. It was like holding up a mirror. I know. What yeah. What was your immediate reaction to that? Like, as a mother, my immediate reaction to be would be, like, one, defensive, and be like, no, we do. Look at all the times that I do spend wonderful time with you. And then also to be like, wait, like, I'm, and then internalize and feel like I've missed the mark again. That was exactly my reaction. I was really defensive. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> what are you talking about? You're just a little child. I spent most time with you. Mm -hmm. And she's like, mm-mm, you cook, <laughs> you clean, and you make us do our homework. You don't spend quality time with us. Mm. And then that's when you look in and you're like, oh, now I've, it's another thing I've missed the mark on. Yeah, I was teary-eyed. Oh. And I kind of understood the, um, the truth in her remarks. Mm -hmm. And also I wasn't ready to accept my fault in it that, in actuality, I wasn't spending quality time with them. I was making them do chores, homework. So later on, it was a time to reflect and go deep down into my own like uh, mind that what should I really be doing in my life. Right. Okay. So again, that's what I feel like I your talk made me like call to the carpet on it was like i find myself getting caught up in a lot of really good things they're not inherently bad mm -hmm. cooking cleaning mm -hmm. making your children do homework things like that are not inherently bad things mm -hmm. but if it exhausts your family to the point that you have no time to do anything other than come home and fall into bed yeah then what kind of a life is that actually exactly we try to be such a perfectionist that we make everything into like everything like I I made everything into a chore mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so perfectionism is something that that's the lowest standard that we give to ourselves Ooh, okay so yeah. that's not through me Tony Robbins says that that if you are a perfectionist you are unlucky because you are giving yourself the lowest standard I've never heard it put like that that's very yes interesting. yeah so instead of being perfectionist we have to be um, go out there and do things that make you happy so what kinds of stuff did you immediately after like taking a time to reflect did you immediately like strip away from your schedules and calendars before like uh, this happened I was a helicopter mom so my kids were into were doing so many mm -hmm. extracurricular activities and I was also busy cooking cleaning and everything so I made some uh, thoughtful kind of rational changes to my schedule so I started cooking a bit less. Mm -hmm. So cook one day, my husband and I partner one day and keep it in the fridge, mm -hmm. right? And then I try to change my kids' schedule, like made it more relaxed so it's yeah. easy for them. Otherwise, you know, what's the point of sending our kids to extracurricular activities all day long when they don't have a little moment of reflection? Mm -hmm. Because they also need that mental... Uh, mental peace yes absolutely so those were some of the changes that changed my life and my kids life we became happy as a family not that 
we were not happy. Right. Again, we were happy. All the things you were filled with were still good. Yes. They weren't inherently bad. No. Any of them immediately. Mm -hmm. But you know. You have to have support system. If you have people who you can uh, bring in and they can help you with cooking and also cleaning, instead of you doing the cleaning for Absolutely. once a week, you can hire someone to do the cleaning for you. Because you can either be cleaning the house all day long or take your kids to extracurricular activities. You have to kind of uh, choose from mm -hmm. which one is more important for you at that point in time. Absolutely. That so it, I think it reminds me of so many things. I feel like that's the biggest piece of advice I got when I was coming into the workforce mm -hmm. was from other working moms. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you can have it all, quote unquote, but you have to know, like you can juggle all the balls. You just have to know which ones are glass and yeah. which ones are plastic. Yeah. They're like, because if you drop the glass ones, you're in trouble. But if you drop the other ones, then they'll bounce back and it's fine. Yes. Like you can be fine without a home cooked dinner. Yeah. You know, you can be fine with someone else cleaning your house. You can be, but if you drop the big stuff, yeah. the glass ones, and everybody's glass ones look different. Yeah, that's the thing too. Is like yeah. everybody's family happiness, their un, their unit. Yes, and everybody's individual mental health too looks different. Yeah. The things that need to be prioritized to gain that balance look different for everybody. Yeah, that's very true. You know, exactly this, that was the decision I went through and I did exactly like that. What's more important for me? My time with my kids. Mm -hmm. And that was because at that time I was also going to school. And I had a choice to either not go to school and spend all the time with my kids, do cleaning and everything. So instead of that, I had to kind of sacrifice some of the um, corporal duties mm -hmm. that I do in the house on a daily basis and instead I chose to spend time with my kids and also focus on my studies and also some part of it was focused on our business. Okay I like that that's it's just a good reminder. I what, love that. what I think is so powerful about what you just said is the actionable steps are great but it's also the bigger messaging of breaking that generational yeah. cycle because as women, I feel like we learn a lot from watching our mothers. We learn a lot from watching those influences in our life. And if you were to have continued that way, your kids are seeing that that's what they should emulate, that that is with the path that they should go down as well. And with you kind of breaking that chain and being like, no, we're going to input these things here, here, and here, I think you have given your kids the uplifting thing they need to then go continue to fuel that forward. Yeah, that's that's exactly the thing. You know, sometimes we end up glorifying suffering and yes. too much work for women. Absolutely. You know? Yes, so absolutely. So we have to stop doing that. If I am not a uh, 18th century looking mother <laughs> who yeah. does all the work, absolutely. does yeah. that make me a bad mother? No. No, right? So I have other things to focus on because... If I spend cleaning and cooking in the house all day long, how am I supposed to focus on my other humanitarian projects, mm -hmm. right. right? I have to choose where I'm most needed, what's more important to make me uh, fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So this is the conditioning that we have to step out of. We have to break the cycle somewhere. If not us, then who? Right. Yeah. Right? Um, we have to ask this question to ourselves every day. Yeah. That if not me, then who? That perfectionism thing you brought up earlier, kind of, because I'm not a mother. So, like, that, like, your, the specific examples don't apply to me, but this whole image, like, messaging does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I feel the voids other ways. I don't have children, yeah. I don't have a family, but I sometimes am still, I feel like I always have to be on. I always have to say yes. If someone mm -hmm. asks me to do something, I have to say yes. It's the perfectionist. I mean, I have to do it the best. Yes. Like, I can't say no. So I feel like what you're saying is just applicable beyond that family model. It's oh, absolutely. To everyone listening. Yeah. Everybody, no matter what stage of life, you know, like we talked about earlier, male, female, anybody mm -hmm. listening to this podcast has a million things pulling at you. I would venture to say. <laughs> I would venture to say everybody has too many things on their plate and yeah. could stand to give up a few in in yeah. in pursuit of some mental health. That's true. That's totally. Something I'm curious about is, was there a cultural shift in being agreeable, like when you moved to the United States or even to Canada? Like, were there differences, but the underlying cause was still you need to be agreeable? Did it look different, or was it the main things were still there? You, 
it's it's funny that you might think it's totally different but it's still the same the mm -hmm. underlying yeah, issue yeah. is the same you can come from a different background i can come from a different background but if you see deeply we've always been expected to do certain things and we have been doing them it's interesting to me too again like so i'm a born and raised memphian mm -hmm. we talked about this on the podcast before but i find myself highly traditional Mm -hmm. I find myself like leaning into traditions a lot. So whether it's a specific way we celebrate holidays or the activities we participate yeah. in, um, how have you personally found balance between holding space for things like tradition at all or like customs or things like that and then also finding the space to be able to say this isn't serving me? You know, let me tell you this. We live in the South, right? Yes. South is not very far away from a very traditional culture mm -hmm. so when I'm from Pakistan I'm a Muslim so the traditions are not very different you celebrate Christmas I celebrate Eid mm -hmm. so um, you are expected to have to gather your family members in your house when it's Christmas I'm also expected to have family members and uh, feed them when it's Eid right so the traditions are different but the expectations, what we do with those traditions are uh, uniformly almost the same. Mm -hmm. So I didn't find it very different. Did you, like, when you had that uh, awakening, though, from your daughter, and mm -hmm. you, you started, like, stripping things out of your schedule, yeah. did you find that it was difficult to let go of some of the traditional things? Or for you personally, was it not that hard? No, it wasn't that hard for me because uh, tradition. I uh, like, like I said, we all have four days for what we do best and what we like to do and what mm -hmm. we don't like to do. Right? Mm -hmm. um, cooking every day was not my thing, <laughs> though I was cooking every day. Okay. But cooking once a week or twice a week became so easy for me, yeah. and I liked it because all the other days I'm not cooking. Right, and it made it enjoyable because you didn't I made feel it the, the chore. Like you said, you were making everything into a have to have. I had to, to do have. it. Yes. Instead yes. of I want to do it. I want to do it. True. That's interesting. So these are the, some of the things. I think we have to um, sacrifice something for the other. Yeah. What's more important? We have to choose that one. So saying yes to something is saying no to something else. Of course. And saying it's no always saying, a yeah. trade-off. Yes. yes. Always. Life is a trade-off. Definitely. And I know you spoke to like having that strong support system in place. So I'm kind of curious, as you start to shift how you focus things, I know I'm very close to my family. They're a strong yeah. support system for me. But they also have expectations yeah. that I am also at a combat with sometimes. And I'm like, that's where my agreeableness is getting pushed. So how was your family when you started taking on this model of being disagreeable? Uh, it's, you know, it's a strong word when I say being, it was not like I put uh, put my foot down Absolutely, yeah. at <laughs> on one every point yeah. and I said, I'm disagreeable, Correct. I'm not doing no. anything. No, but no, you no, have to, all. yeah, you have to move your way through yeah. uh, so many things. You have to, uh, when you are thinking shifts, in a few months, you mm -hmm. will see that your life has changed around your thinking yeah. because you make those changes eventually. You do not change like drastically Absolutely. like that. And the the thing I say about support system, it's very important for us because you know there's a whole community, the culture, family behind a guy to make him successful mm -hmm. in his career. When we talk about sons we talk about their career when they start making money we ask them Definitely. to then get married on the other hand we do not do that for girls mm -hmm. okay girls are the biggest support in their families for their family for their family members mm -hmm. uh, mainly guys mm -hmm. so we have to now understand the fact that uh, uh, the thing that they say self-made it's a vague concept in my opinion, because there's no such thing as being self-made. How are you consider yourself self-made when the whole community, whole culture is supporting you to become successful, mm -hmm. to become the man of your words, to become, to make more money, only because your um, family's money did not drop down to you doesn't mean you that are self-made. Self yeah. Okay, so women now need the same support, the same kind of societal support, cultural support, and family support. If not material support, at least 
mental support Absolutely. that we know you can succeed. Hey, how is your career going? That brings up an amazing yeah. point because I feel like whenever I walk into a room, specific family, anywhere, it's always, who are you dating? When when do you when do you think you're gonna, are you gonna ever get married? Look at that. Like what is and when my male counterparts, whether that be a male relative, a male friend, it's always, hey, how's work going? Exactly. What are you working on these days? It's never that way for me. It's always about the relationship part that's expected of me first. Yes. Because you are praised for being, Correct. not for your actions. Just exactly. like what you talked about from yes. before. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm actually more successful than him. So how about you ask me how my, how work, my is. work is yeah. going? And then you ask him when he's going to go get a wife because he has been dating everybody these days. So <laughs> Exactly. You know, it's just it's that dichotomy of like, why can people not share? shift this narrative exactly it it makes you such a put down right yes i mean feel it. bad no, and insert whatever blank that is that's the thing yeah at any stage of life it feels like particularly i'm griping on behalf of women here um but again i do understand that everyone else is not exempt from this pressure yeah, but absolutely. yeah i mean whatever that blank is it's like yeah. Are you going to go for a run today? Are you going to have more kids? Are you going to, you know, did you not think it was uh, appropriate to do your hair today? Like, mm -hmm. are you go are you not going to be meeting people? And it's like, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, exactly. I have a mirror. <laughs> I can see how I'm showing up in the world, believe it or not. That's true. And yeah. needless to say, I can show up and do a darn good job even if I don't have makeup on. <coughs> yeah, like, absolutely. I mean, that's the other piece that goes back to societal expectations, which we could harp on I know, forever. we don't have to. But um, um, something I did want to talk about is that in your TED Talk, um, in your TED Talk, you uh, showed a small clip from your film to go yes. along with your talk. And for those listening to the talk just a minute ago, they um, you can go see it on the TEDx Memphis YouTube page also. But I wanted you to talk a little bit about the clip that you showed and tell us about the importance of showcasing that particular clip alongside mental health awareness and being disagreeable. Okay. That's, uh, um, Anna, that's the clip from, um, from the film. Mm -hmm. It shows when the girl had enough of the mental stress and the pressure, she is uh, going to attempt suicide. She's she walking in, she's very desperate, and uh, she has no, she found no other um, outlet where she can went or she can go to some uh, help or something. So it's that moment where she has decided that this is the only way to go mm -hmm. but this story is not the story of suicide this is a story of hope in the midst of negativity despair and sadness so um, even in that moment when you are very sad you have to sit and reflect on some of the things that can go right in your life mm -hmm. so the film is, of course, we didn't have time to show the whole film. Right. It's a 30 minute long film. At the end, uh, we show, we give hope in the film that that girl is finally saved. I thought it was um, <coughs> interesting that you chose that clip um, because it does show this woman in deep despair and she's standing on the precipice. She's yeah. standing on that bridge. You can see the rushing water below her. Yeah. You can feel the heaviness that she is carrying with her. Yeah. And it ends there. She's standing there for yeah. that moment of reflection. Yeah. And so I found that to be very powerful because I feel like at any given time, any number of people mm -hmm. in Memphis, in our country, around the world can feel that heaviness and mm -hmm. feel like there is possibly only one way exactly. to because, find relief. Yes, because mental health, people don't understand mental health hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a hurt somewhere in your body or everywhere in your body mm -hmm. because uh, mind controls everything. Absolutely. When mind is in pain, the whole body, the whole being is in pain. People don't understand that. Sometimes we ask questions and we have to, we all have to have this type of education that what should we say when people are uh, telling us about their mental problems? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are not equipped. I'm not equipped. Mm. So uh, kind of we have to uh, educate ourselves in that. 
Absolutely. I think we have a long way to go. I think society is catching up oh, to yeah. that. Not as fast as we would probably like to see, no. but I do think that conversation is happening more and more. Yeah. And my hope for the future is that that continues. Yeah. Um, and we kind of keep forging forward there. So on that note of continuing forward, what is your hope for when people see your talk, when they listen to your talk, what do you hope they take away most from it? Uh, you know, uh, one thing is uh, prioritize mental health. Another thing is uh, support system for every person is very important. Mm -hmm. Men, women, children. And third thing I would say is society's expectations that are not serving you yeah. are not worth lingering on to. So it's important that we let go some of the uh, expectations. Sometimes we follow other people's expectations because we want to be perfect in yeah. every way. <laughs> That's not possible, right? Perfectionism is not the thing we should strive. We should strive to be successful and fulfilled. Yeah. Perfectionism doesn't make us fulfilled. It makes us frustrated, tensed, yeah. and upset all the time. I feel like we think it's going to make us happy, like achieving this thing of perfection, no matter what in your head that is yeah, for you. Right. It could be like, when I get to this level of my mm -hmm. career, I'm going to feel great and amazing. Yeah. And I think what we so often find ourselves in the loop of, or at least I can speak from personal yeah. experience, I'll use an I statement here, is I'm like, oh, I just need to get through this rough patch, and when I get here, everything's going to be better. And then I get there, and I'm like, oh what I just like spent so much time striving 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 and now I put so much pressure on this thing now that I'm here it doesn't necessarily live up to that expectation that I put in my head true and it's just I feel like as a society we're conditioned to do that right because we don't know what's perfection yeah exactly because when we it's achieve that up. we don't know there's always something next there's always something Correct. next and yes. it's never enough never enough like spending your life plotting your step and not enjoying the present, I think mm -hmm. has been one thing I take away from your talk. Um, it's very like living in the moment you're in now, yeah. um, which is kind of some subtext I got from your talk. Yeah. But it's also something that hits really hard for me because I am that person who is always, one, I'm just an anxious individual <laughs> who is a perfectionist. And so just trying to strive to that next thing. But that doesn't, you're not living no. if you're always looking to that next place. True. And so I'm kind well, of... I feel like it also, like for me, it. I feel like I, I'll use another I statement, I feel like a lot of times it's easier to just go with the flow. Yeah. You think you're doing yourself a favor. Like, yeah. okay, it's not worth the conflict. True. Uh, it's not worth, you know, this being the thing that I combat people on. Yeah. But <laughs> what happens when you do that over and over and over and over again is that it hasn't helped. It wasn't actually easier. All you've done is made it more difficult for yourself in the long run. Yes. Because you haven't won any of your small battles. So how can you win the war at the end for yourself? You know what I mean? Like you, yeah. you go into that mindset of being agreeable, thinking that it's going to be easier, and it's not. That's yeah. true. The yeah. outcome, the outcome is that it's actually just much harder for yourself. Yeah, you put it really mentally, bad. if not anything else. I think that was going to be my next question for you is, you know, being disagreeable saved your life as the title of your talk, you know. So as you have gone forward, has being disagreeable become a little bit easier for you? You know, if we understand it well, becoming disagreeable is easier than becoming agreeable. Because when you are That's agreeable, fair. you are working hard from your mind, from your soul to fulfill other people's mm -hmm. expectations of you. So when you are disagreeable to other people's expectations that are not serving you, then you are only serving you and your higher self, right? So um, that way, when you are disagreeable, you are nice to other people because you're not doing things because somebody else is expecting you to do. You are doing them because that makes you happy. Yeah. You're right. putting yourself so first. I have found becoming disagreeable more easy because when you are disagreeable to certain things, it's easy for you to say, no, I'm sorry, I'm busy, I cannot fulfill this uh, task, I'm busy with other things. But if I can do it on uh, Tuesday next week, I will do it. 
right? Yeah, right? Instead of saying, okay, and then putting yourself into a uh, tremendous pressure to fulfill because in your mind you are a perfectionist too mm -hmm. because you want to fulfill it uh, to the uh, minute details. Yeah. It's also kinder. Like you said, it's easier, but it's also kinder. Now that you're talking through it, I can, it's kinder to yourself, first off. Yes. But it's also kinder to those around you because they know when you show up, you're doing it exactly. out of genuine, authentic desire to be there. Yeah. Yes. Instead of just showing up because you feel obligated. I feel like nobody wants your obligation. Exactly. <laughs> People want you because of you. True. They don't want you because you felt like you had to show up for them. Yeah. Sacrificing yourself is not a kindness to it others. Isn't. It's or yourself. So yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's a very powerful thing yeah. to kind of sit back and think about, um, especially for me. <laughs> oh, same. <laughs> like the br there is bravery and power in saying no. Yeah. Dear listener. And it's okay. Believe me, we always we every day we learn to say no. Yeah. And I start over again every day. Yeah. yeah. Well, it extends past yeah. just generic like work is the easiest place that we all that probably listening to this mm -hmm. people can relate to saying no but it also extends to your interpersonal relationships sure. like I, I, be glad you guys don't have to date but there are times like where I find myself being like yeah I'll I'll go or like yes I, I'm okay with this thing you did like you I really feel disrespected by what you just did to me but I'm gonna say it's okay just so I don't rough in the waters because I don't want to cause any trouble right now that's not okay mm -mm. And it is a disservice yeah. to me to do that in my life in any portion. So I am very happy that we got to have this chat with you today. Oh, so yeah, happy. Ugh, it's so good. It is, yeah. Much needed for everyone. It's, it was cathartic Thank for you. me. Yes. I don't know about the listener, but I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it, too. Good. Well, we have a couple of last-minute questions. Okay. So you do a lot. You and your family have the Shaw Holdings. Like, you guys do so much. How can people keep up with you and what you guys work on? Um, Shah Holdings Group is a business that yeah. we have an office for it, and um, we go there in the morning yeah. to work, <laughs> yeah, like we and do then all we the work. go back home. <laughs> and then I have a production company that yes. I opened last year. So, uh, you know, like I said, I became a producer out of default. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm a producer, there are certain causes that are closer to my right. heart, so I want to highlight them. Mm -hmm. So, I did make a film about mental health and suicide, and it has made its way into mainstream media, and uh, it has uh, become a kind of a, a good, uh, good way that people talk about it now, yeah. mental health and suicide. Another um, thing that was so closer to my heart, another cause, was uh, child labor. Mm -hmm. So I am in the production of making another feature film. Oh, cool. oh wow. Child labor, that's the ne next thing. Wow. So Already <laughs> working on the next one. <laughs> yes. And I it's a feature film, right? It's going to be a feature film. Wow. Okay. So you step out of that comfort zone again. Not a short film. It's going to be big. Okay. It's wow. going to be a big. Yeah. I stepped out of that comfort zone because, uh, you know, after making this film, I realized if a short film can impact so much, make people think about a certain topic, then if I want to raise awareness about other stuff, I should go about visual medium mm -hmm. so i love that there Absolutely. was another project so i am doing that right now oh, that's so cool thank you we're super excited for you so last but certainly not least we like to end the show by asking this question to our guest and kind of close out this way we never prepared them for it okay. so it's not that we forgot to ask you we just want to get your first instinctual answer so um you have chosen memphis you have made your home here your family is here um, what does being a Memphian mean to you? Um, being a Memphian, I, I like Memphis. It's, people are really good here. Mm -hmm. And, um, my family loves Memphis. My, almost my whole family is here. Oh, amazing. And also, you know, uh, people in Memphis are very good with volunteerism. When you have, when we have programs here, you see people going out and about, doing community services. I think um, uh, Memphis is uh, very good in giving back to the community. Yeah, I, I really like that. And uh, I've come from Pakistan. I moved here. Like I have lived here more than half of my life. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I'm a Memphian. Mm -hmm. 
Both of my kids are Memphian and they love Memphis. My son says he can go to any place <laughs> in the world, but at the end he needs to come back to Memphis. I love that. So uh, we precious. love Memphis. We love Memphis people and we have a community here, Pakistani community, and we just we, we enjoy Memphis. Yeah, you rally behind the city. Oh, yes. Love it. I love that. Well, thank you thank so much. Thank you so much. This has been tremendous and we cannot wait to see what wonderful things you do in the future and we're excited for the big premiere thank you so much i really appreciate your time here okay guys that is the end of today's show and it's a heavy topic um, it is we knew that going in yeah. um but i do feel like nigat addresses it all with yeah. such as you said vulnerability and grace she has such a genuine heart and her motivation behind spreading the message about support systems for everybody mm -hmm. is so authentic. And I, I really appreciate that about the way that she delivers this difficult subject. Yes, I agree. And if you or anyone listening is struggling with your mental health, um, it is okay to seek help uh, and to ask your support system. She kind of spoke to it a little bit about those around her um, and finding that support system, whether that's people you know, whether it's people you don't. Um, don't be afraid to figure it out uh, because it is a heavy subject and it's something that is a real personal journey to everyone going through it, um, no matter how you identify. So Absolutely. on that note, we are so happy that Nigat opened up herself to this episode and that we kind of got to know a little bit more. And we're just going to end on some reflection and then just a little bit of last minute announcement. So what is going on in New Memphis, A.T.? I'm so glad you asked, Christy. <laughs> Um, coming up at the end of June, specifically on June 21st from 12 to 1.30 p.m., uh, we will be having our next Celebrate What's Right, and this one is titled The Great Abate. So solving every problem is not always as easy as A plus B equals C. What? I know. More often than not, the formula is complex, and it requires details, calculations, unknown variables, and before you arrive at the result, it can be challenging. Yeah. But our city's youth do not have the time to wait for a solution for the day-to-day -day challenges of living in poverty. And the reality of all of this is that their worth is so much more than the sum of their circumstances. So we are putting this topic on display. Join New Memphis as we listen to a panel of leading experts moderated by Dr. Kenneth Robinson of the United Way of the Mid-South for the Great Abate, a conversation focused on understanding and reducing youth poverty right here in Memphis. You'll learn about the root causes that contribute to youth poverty, the creative ways that Memphians are banding together to fill in those gaps, and how you have a responsibility and an opportunity to step in and step up to be the answer for our city's future. So again, we will be there on June 21st. We will be at the Hilton Memphis on June 21st from 12 to 1.30 p.m. And this event would not be possible without our generous sponsors, First Horizon Foundation and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. So I am... I'm excited, much like our previous Celebrate What's Right this year, which was on What the Tech. Mm -hmm. This one is something, again, that I don't know a lot about, but I know that it's important. I know that I need to know more about it. Absolutely, and I think it, it even though this wasn't the intent, we've had the Celebrate What's Right planned for a minute, um, it ties in very interestingly to our episode today because these youth living in poverty, it is very impactful to their mental health and the cycle that that perpetuates and continues for them. So guys, come on out, learn a little bit more about how you can be part of the solution to poverty abatement in Memphis specifically for our city's youth it is very crucial and needed and we can't solve it without the help of everyone so other than that other than that I feel like it is a good place today to kind of like you said reflect yeah. and kind of leave some of the other noise um set it aside yeah because I think that this topic was critically important for the health and wellness of every individual in this community and beyond. Yeah. And again, to echo what Christy has already um, mentioned, there are actually a lot of resources right here in Memphis to help with mental health and with suicide prevention. And we encourage anyone who is struggling with any of this to um, speak up and speak out to any number of people. Um, there is bravery and power and saying that you're not okay. Yeah, you don't have to go through it alone. You don't. Um, so on that note, we thank you so much for tuning in today, and we will see you next time, Memphis. Bye. Bye. <laughs> 
week's episode was made possible by our friends at Independent Bank. You can learn more about them at i-bankonline.com.